Welcome to Sunday Morning at South Brandon Worship Center. It is vitally important that we as believers understand who we are. When we do, when we truly understand who we are and the implications of that and how to walk in the fullness of who we are as children, sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the world is impacted dramatically. It's transformed. I believe that is the Lord's purpose for us. Now, I had a wake-up call recently. You know what I mean when I say wake-up call? Not what you're looking for, but, but reality hits you in the face. I'm turning, I just turned 49. Actually, I'll turn 50. And, I, and I've been saying to myself, I'm going to be in the best shape when I turn 50 of my whole life. And I began to change my eating habits, began to, to work out. I was feeling really good. Looking in the mirror, going... All right, we're moving in the right direction at least, okay? And then this past weekend, flew to Phoenix, and I was there with, with Andrew and another gentleman, and, and we had a lot of meetings out there and, and some amazing stuff God was doing. And, and one day, me and Andrew went to hike up Squaw Peak. Now, there's Camelback Mountain and there's Squaw Peak. I've hiked up both. But we were very close to Squaw Peak where we stayed, so we said, let's just go there. And because I've been working out, I was pretty sure I am going to just destroy this mountain. And I've been playing a little bit of tennis, and, and, and so I was thinking, I'm, I'm moving in the right direction. This is not going to be hard. Three quarters of the way up it, I had already stopped twice for some extended breaks. And the last quarter of this mountain is like, it's, you know, just back and forth, pretty steep. And I was looking at that, going, I can't do this. And I saw these old men, easily twice my weight, running up this mountain. I was going, how in the world? So I got motivated. I was, I'm going to finish this thing. So I, I, was, I was about halfway up that last quarter when Andrew was coming down. I thought, you saved me. Because he had hung with me most of the way, and then he took off, went to the top, and, and uh, he was on his way back down. I, I said, yeah, let's just go back down. And I get down to that, to that place where I had stopped, and there's this nine, it looked like nine and a half month pregnant woman. I mean, she was very pregnant. Not that you can be half pregnant, but you know what I mean? Like, she was ready to deliver, and she was going, this is harder than normal. I was like, oh, I quit. I, I give up. <laughs> Do you ever have those wake-up calls where you think you're at one level and then reality hits you in the face? I remember getting WeFit, and I stood on WeFit, and I had one picture of myself, and then I put all the information in there, and WeFit says I look like a pear. I was like, what does this thing know? And I'm at Walgreens one day, and you stick your arm in the blood pressure cuff, and, and that thing takes your blood pressure. It takes all kind of stuff now. They got this new machine. Or actually, it was Publix. And, uh, and it tells you all kind of stuff, like you're not in good shape. And I was like, what does this machine know? Sometimes we need a wake-up call in our life. And what I want to talk today about is a spiritual wake-up call. I was uh, at a church in Singapore back in, in my graduate days, and we, we were studying world-class cell group churches, and this church was amazing. Week after week, God just was doing some amazing things, and, and the very first Sunday I was there, I was sitting in the seat with 12 other seminary students. The service hadn't even started. Band was, you know, tuning their instruments. Worship practice was going on. There were some dancers dancing. And I was experiencing something that was unusual for me. I, I was having a hard time. How do I put this into words? And I finally leaned over and I said, guys, there's something different here. It's like God is here. Now, think about that for a second. I've been in church every time the doors were open. But there was something different about this place. The service had not even started. And it was the thickness of the presence of God that was different. And I didn't know another way to put it, except that I knew God is here. I don't 
know if it was that Sunday or the next Sunday. It was one, I was only there about four Sundays. And the pastor stood up. He was dressed all in black. And he said, this morning I was embarrassed driving out of my parking lot. What are people going to think? I've got a black shirt and black pants and black suit on. And he said, it looks like I'm coming to a funeral. He said, but I spent two hours a day in the presence of God, and I was in the presence of God. And the Lord, and I said to the Lord, what do you think about the church? It was four years old, 4,800 people. And he said, Lord, what do you think? Church wanting to take Singapore. And the Lord said, I am not pleased. And he was like, why? And he said, because I've given you a clear vision and a clear call to call these people to a higher standard. And they're not walking in it. They are not walking in the fullness of what the vision of this house is, of what I've given you. And he began to go point by point through the things that they had been calling their church to do. I've never seen anything like it. He said, we've been calling our church a church of prayer. And we've been saying, if we would pray an hour a day, we would take this nation, we would transform this nation. And he said, this morning I want to ask you to raise your hands if you've been praying an hour a day. Oh my gosh, right in front of the whole auditorium. There may have been a dozen to 16 hands that went up. There was four services. There was about 1,000, 1,200 people per service. And they said, we've been calling the church to read through the Bible in a year. 15 minutes of scripture reading a day. And he said, how many of you have been doing it? Now, I've got to tell you, I, I can't communicate how much love was in the heart of this pastor and how much lo the love of Christ was coming through as he presented this. But what he was doing was he was drawing the line and saying, this is what God has called us to. How many measure up to the plumb line of what the Lord's called us to as a church? And there weren't many that could cross that line. A lot of people had cheered on a lot of Sunday mornings. What a powerful message. A lot of people said, yes, this is my church. This is where we're going. But actions speak louder than words. And he was calling them to check themselves. And it was fairly interesting. Where he got to in this message was he said, we got to come to a conclusion about where we really stand and who we really are. He goes, I would rather have 400 people here next week, one service, and a lot of empty seats of the people that are ready to say, yes, we buy into this vision, and we're going to go with God. than 4,800 people. It was Gideon's paring down the army. And he said, because it's okay to just admit it. This, to me, it's just religious exercise. Uh, it's something I go to on Sunday mornings. I, I'm not really sold out. It's okay to admit that. And he goes, there's a lot of places that, that that's the vision and that's okay. But that's not going to be okay here. You are loved. You are accepted. Now, if you're a seeker and you're coming here and you're trying to check this out, he goes, that's different. He goes, there's people that have been here 10 years, 20 years. Of course, that, no, that church was only there four years. <clears throat> Some of you have been here since the beginning for four years. And you said yes, but not with your actions. I forget the, the, the list of different things that he called people to, but it was interesting. It was like he had a wake-up call, and that church had a wake-up call. How do we determine our true spiritual condition? Do we ever take time to examine what is my real spiritual condition? That's what I believe God wants us to do today. To examine our true spiritual condition. I remember myself. I was 
pretty happy. It was in one of the fastest growing churches. And, and, and the youth ministry that I was heading up with, was thriving. And it was like God stopped me in my tracks. And there were several scriptures that he used. One was Revelation 3 about the church in Laodicea. The church in Laodicea thought they were rich, well off, and had need of nothing spiritually. But Jesus, the one who died for the church, the foundation, the cornerstone of the church, the one who loves the church more than anyone else, in fact, the injunctions of Scripture, our husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Christ, in his infinite love, said to me, you don't realize your true spiritual condition. You're poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. Buy from me gold refined in the fire. He used 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5. through 5. In the latter days, there will be those. Uh, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, proud, disobedient to parents, etc., etc., having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. I was like, I didn't deny the power of God. I know God has power. But practically, in my life, there was no operation of the power of God. God drew the plumb line. He drew the line in the sand. He said, Richard, are you content to stay where you are, or are you ready to take the next step? Are you ready to really encounter me? Really walk with me? Really follow me? Really catch my vision? You see, I believe the Bible gives us a standard. I believe it gives us a pretty clear standard. But I believe Western Christianity has forgotten that standard. We've lost it. Definitions have been radically changed. And I believe one of the first things we have to do to understand God's vision, God's plan, His purpose, the first part of the wake-up call is throwing away our playbook for being a Christian. That sounds pretty radical. What does it mean to be a Christian? I don't think most people have a clue. First of all, do you know how many times the word Christian's in the Bible? Three times. It's not even in the Bible until the latter part of Acts. And, and we don't get the definition that most people have an answer. What, what is a Christian? And, and when we had a whiteboard up here, we could draw a lot of things. Typically, it boils down to a handful of things. And, and I want to boil it down to the lowest common denominator. As we Westerners tend to understand what disciple means. It means someone who has prayed a prayer to ask Jesus Christ to come into their heart, accepting him as their personal savior, and knows for sure that when they die, they're going to go to heaven. And we believe that that is the primary mandate of the church. There is nowhere in scripture that we are called to make Christians. This sounds pretty radical, pretty extreme. But you can look it up yourself. How do we use that word Christian? How do we come to use it in the way that we use it today? Do you know the primary word that people were called in the Bible? Disciples. The word followers in there seven times. The word believers in there, I believe, three times. The word disciple is in there 269 times. The Bible is very clear what it means to be a disciple. The commission is very clear to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. So what does it mean to be a disciple of the King of kings and the Lord of lords? What is the mandate of God's word? that we're to be about. I believe one of the most foundational components for our true spiritual condition is are you a disciple? Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? What does that look like? 
One of the frustrating things is I began my journey into some of these things. I, it started for me with a 20-day fast. And I opened up the Word of God, laid on the floor for like six hours a day just to encounter God. I did not know how to hear God's voice. The Lord was calling me out of, out, out of a Laodicean-type Christianity and, into, and I was going, what does that even look like? And laying on the floor with my face in the Word, crying out to the Lord. It was like Scripture became so clear. It was like I began to see what had been there all along, blatantly obvious. And that's what I want to present to you. What I believe that anybody that will test this in the, in the Scriptures, which is, is the wisest thing you could do, is going to come to understand what it is that we, the mandate, what we are called to do and to be. The frustrating thing about that is, is I could see Jesus was teaching his disciples to cast out evil spirits, to heal the sick, to preach the kingdom of God. Stuff that in seven years of theological training I didn't get any of. Been in Sunday school class, church service after church service after church service, and never saw these things. And I was beginning to see, this is what Jesus taught his disciples to do. But we as Westerners want a formula. Three easy steps to do this. Four easy steps to do that. And, and I was going, come on, tell me exactly what, what's the prayer that you pray to heal the sick. And Jesus didn't pray the same thing twice. Okay, if you're going to run into someone with demons, what do you do? Give me A, B, C, D. And what Jesus laid out, I believe, first and foremost, floored me. He said, I do nothing of my own initiative. I only do what I see the Father doing. In John 10, Jesus, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. One of the first and foremost components, I believe, of being a disciple, Jesus himself modeled it. Is listening to the Father's voice. Look in John 10, verses 3 and following. The doorkeeper opens the door for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own sheep, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. They will never follow a stranger, but will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus told them this parable, but they did not understand what he was saying. He said, I tell you the truth. I am the door for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and may have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not a shepherd and does not own sheep sees the wolf coming and abandons the sheep and turns away. So the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. I am the good shepherd, verse 14. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me. I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus knew how to hear the voice of the Father. In the midst of the crowd, in the midst of, of doing miracles, he would pull away because he knew how vital it was to abide in the presence of his Father. That's where he got direction. That's where he got insight. That's where he got strength and built up. Most of my Christian life, I did not know how to hear the voice of God. I didn't realize that God's talking all the time. Because no one explained to me how to hear his voice. How can you get a seminary degree and never have a class about hearing God's voice? The closest we got was Henry Blackaby's experiencing God. And we knew how to hear God's voice through scripture. We knew, we knew there, there was a handful of things. But there is so much more. I began writing down every different way that God spoke. 
I'm only up in, in, in that. I, I, I create a lot of these type of things. But, but going from Genesis to Revelation, I was through, through the first five books of the Bible, and I was at um, over 100 ways that God speaks. Just in the first five books of the Bible. There are so many unique, amazing ways that God speaks to us. And the only way I was taught was through Scripture. We're going to be teaching on Sunday nights about how to hear God's voice. And that's one of the most important, most foundational, most basic components of a relationship. I know that I had a vital relationship with God, knowing Him through the Scriptures. I know that it began for me when I was about 13 years of age. But I don't compare what I call a relationship now with what I had then. There is, there's no comparison. In fact, what I've experienced is within a six-month period of time, numerous times within the last few years, it's like such a quantum leap in relationship that I was like, how could I have been satisfied here with what I'm experiencing now? And that's what God wants for us. It's one of the most vital components to the Christian life. The sad thing is, I know well how to hear God's voice. But if I don't listen, I don't hear. My wife just confronted me the other day. She goes, Richard, you are amazing at listening to people in ministry. But when we're together sometimes, you are distracted and, and, and you don't listen well. I want you to listen as well when you are with me. And you know what the Lord tells me sometimes? Richard, sometimes you don't stop and listen. My wife is often says, I'm facing some decision and seeking her counsel. I'm wrestling with it. She goes, have you asked the Lord? I'm like, I've been meaning to. I've been planning on it. All I have to do is ask him. And he speaks very clearly, very specifically. Sometimes I ask him a question. And he answers me with a question. I don't always like that. He doesn't always answer me the way I would like for him to answer me, but he always speaks. Not just because who I am, but that's his purpose. That's his plan for every one of us. That was what Christ modeled. It's what it means to be a disciple. A disciple is a learner. Another word is an imitator. Jesus said, it is enough for a disciple that he be like his master. What Jesus wants is for us to be like him. When we look at his life, that our life would exemplify his life in every single facet. Because he is in us now. And when we recognize that, when we wake up to that reality, it's incredible. The next thing we see in Jesus is in John chapter 8. Jesus did nothing of his own initiative. In verse 42, If God were your Father, you would love me, for I have come from God, and I am now here. I have not come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why don't you understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot accept my teaching. Numerous times throughout that chapter, Jesus is telling them who his Father is that he came to do the will of his Father, that he doesn't do things of his own initiative. He just does what he sees the Father doing. When you know how to hear him, he's going to call you to do the things that Jesus did. If you want to know what the will of the Father is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what God's plan is for a disciple, look at what Jesus taught his disciples. It's kind of that plumb line. It's what sets the standard. When I saw these things, I was a pastor with 12 years of ministry experience on staff at, at a church, and I had to go, this is not, my life does not line up to this, so what do I do about it? I was comfortable. I was content. Until the Lord destroyed my contentment. Sometimes the best thing the Lord can do is destroy our contentment. I said, how do I even get there from here? 
And the Lord began to say, trust me. You see, Jesus, Matthew 10, Mark 6, Luke 9, Luke 10, he sent out the 12, he sent out the 72, and he gave them authority and power. He said, heal the sick. He said, raise the dead. He said, set the captives free. Cleanse the lepers. Freely you've received, freely give. Jesus was not creating consumer Christianity like we have in America today. He was calling for men and women to live the life that he lived, to do the things that he did, not to come for their own benefit. So many times we're promoting, you can come and get free of your anger. You can come and get free of this. You can come and get free of this. And we promote it for, for, for the benefits that it's going to have for you. And it's time for that day to be done here at South Brandon Worship Center. It's not about coming to get for your benefit. There's a lot of sick people out there that are dying, that need sons and daughters of God to set captives free, to heal the sick, to preach the kingdom of God. I don't have, I have people from all over the, the country and all over the world right now been calling our ministry, and I'm going, who can I refer them to? Where are the sons and daughters of God? I, I, my whole clock would be filled up with ministering to people. It already is. I already do a lot. But God wants to raise up a place where people can come from all over the world to find freedom and healing. We've got to get past the consumerism because that's not what Christ called us to. It isn't just about us getting a little better and feeling a little better. It's about us being the people of God. It's about us being like Jesus Walking in the fullness of our authority. The reason I brought these two books up here today. Jesse Berkey is a firefighter paramedic in Sarasota. Buddy of mine. Came, God healed and restored his marriage from infidelity. Set him free. Restored his, his emotions to him. Um, and, and did a lot of miraculous things. He began to walk in the authority and the power of God. And began to, to minister to people. Set people free. And understand who he is in Christ. Today, as a firefighter paramedic in Sarasota, he's raised 10 people from the dead. The first chapter is one of the stories. This is what it's all about. I'm going, okay, a disciple has been made. God, what if we had a church filled with Jesse's? Not just know about it, not just have heard some sermons, but are walking in it, out in the workplace, out in the world. What would that look like? This is my journey, where the Lord took a Baptist youth pastor, taught him who he was. I'm telling you what, I never felt comfortable. There was, I always wanted to refer people to someone else. Because I knew the things that were wrong in my life. God can't use me. But I couldn't find anybody to refer people to. And out of obedience, God just pushing me began to pray for people, and God was setting them free. You're never going to feel like it. You're never going to feel qualified. Part of God's plan is that we understand and walk in the power of God. This was Paul's prayer for the Ephesian Christians. Paul prayed for the Ephesians in, in Ephesians chapter 1. And, and for the Colossian Christians in Colossians chapter 1. And he was praying, Lord, I pray that the eyes of their heart may be enlightened. And God's praying for us today. If Paul was here, he would be praying for us. My prayer for us is, Lord, that the eyes of their heart would be enlightened to understand the glorious riches of our inheritance and his incomparably great power that's at work in us who believe. That same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead that's in you? That's in me? Paul was praying that for them because he understood it. Paul had been a Pharisee. He had been religious. He had done all the religious stuff until he encountered God. And he became a disciple. And he began to understand the difference between religion and being a disciple of Jesus Christ. There's very little comparison. See, Paul walked in the supernatural. 
He raised the dead. He healed the sick. What would a church look like that got this? Imagine it. Imagine a church that was filled with people, not just the, 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 the pastor, not just a few of the elders, that we could come and watch do the things of the kingdom of God, not just some special guests that come in, but what if there was a church that began to understand we are called to be the sons and daughters of God. We, we are not just committed to being Sunday morning church attenders, not just Christians, not just uh, here for a religious experience, but we're going to walk in the fullness of our identity in Christ and be like Jesus. How would that impact the city? How would that impact a nation? How would that impact the whole world? That's Jesus' vision. That's his desire. I could give you a ton of scriptures to, to support that. But what do we do? What do we do when the plumb line is drawn and we look at our life and we go, I'm not where I need to be. I'm not in the place spiritually that I need to be. The pastor in Singapore said, my love for you will only intensify if you today say, you know what, that isn't for me. I, I, I'm, I'm, I've been playing games and, or, or I, I just don't believe that vision and I'm gonna leave this church. He goes, my love and admiration for you would only grow. He goes, I will not be upset. I will not be hurt by anyone who, who today can say that in all honesty. Honesty. This is not for me. He said, but I want to know if there are some of you that maybe you haven't been following, but you believe that it's for you, and you're ready to make that decision. Because there's only one right response. And that's to get up and to repent for being less than God's plan for us as this church and to take that step and say, I'm going to do this. I got to play tennis with him the following week. And this pastor said, I honestly believed we would at least go down to two services. I honestly believed that, he had, that I had spelled it out clearly enough that people were going to say, yeah, that's too much. We're not going there. But what really happened that morning, the front got filled up. People began to stand in the aisles, and then people began to kneel where we, they were because there wasn't any room. There was weeping and wailing because the Spirit of God had caught them to the heart. And they said, I want to be going where this church is going. I want to be what the Lord is commanding us to be so that we can impact the nation. One of the things that they called their people to was giving, and, and the, that next week, the first service, more money was given than had ever been given in four services before. Every cell group more than doubled in size that week. People responded. We have to look at the test and we have to be real. We have to admit where do I stand in light of what the Lord lays out? Where do I want to stand? Sometimes the most honest thing to do is go, you know what, I really don't care about that. I don't want to go there. I appreciate it when people are honest. But sometimes when we look at the test and we go, I didn't pass the test. It's time to go, I want to re-enlist, I want to take the class again because it's worth it. I don't know where you're at today. I believe the Lord's challenged me with these words. And I want to know as a church where we stand. Are we ready to go and go, God, it's not going to be about me anymore. It's not going to be about what I can get but I want to be a disciple, whatever it takes 
to walk in the fullness of who I am in Christ, the fullness of the testament of Christ in me, I'm ready to take that step. I want to know who's ready to join me in that as a church here. Say, I want, I'm going to commit to learning how to hear God's voice. I'm going to commit to knowing who I am in Christ and walking in the fullness of that. Would you just stand? Father God, this morning, we just lay ourselves before you and before your word. We thank you, Lord, for dropping the plumb line. We thank you, Father God, because whenever you do that, you love us like nobody else. And God, you're calling us to more because we are capable of more. And we've been content with less. And Father God, we're here to say today to say, I don't want to be content anymore. I want all. As a church, we want all. <clears throat> we want to walk in the fullness. We want to know what it means to set captives free, to heal the sick, to preach the kingdom of God to open blind eyes, to raise the dead, to see visions and dreams, to encounter you in the fullness of who you are.